Good morning, my name is April Hewlett and I'm with the University of Idaho and today we get to talk about human uses on rangelands. In rangeland management, we have to manage for social, economic, and ecological rangeland sustainability. So that's what we're going to talk about today. To do that, I want you to think back to the beginning of the semester when we consider different values on rangelands. List as many of those human uses on rangelands, including the goods and services that you can think of. From this list, we will build our lecture today, and we'll talk about how ecological, economic, and social aspects are all connected to all the land management decisions we might have to make. So pause the video and list all the human uses that you can remember. Here's my list of human uses. It's definitely not complete, but it's a good start. In order to manage for social, economic, and ecological rangeland sustainability, we have to understand what each of those components means. So this is information taken from a paper called Putting the Pieces Together, Assessing Social, Ecological, and Economical Rangeland Sustainability. And I'll link this article in, on the webpage. But basically, when we think about social aspects to rangeland sustainability, this might include things like the laws or property rights of a particular piece of property. It could include economic policies and practices. It could consider things like land management practices, uh, protection of special values such as open space. It could also include things like the natural fire regime. What are the social impacts of the fire regime and how it changes? Economics are a little more straightforward. This could be different values of forest or forage harvested, for example, or it could mean the wildlife number on the property or even the domestic livestock on rangelands. This could be, or this could refer to sources and amounts of community income. So how does it affect, for example, in Idaho, rural development or rural communities? And ecological principles are a lot of the things that we've covered in class. Things like soil erosion, bare ground cover. What do we have that we want to maintain on a range to make it healthy and sustainable? It could include, again, the natural fire regime, which is actually in all three categories because it spans all these different aspects. Again, it could be preserving wildlife habitat, measuring and monitoring our natural resources. All of these things can fit into these categories. Rangeland ecosystem goods and services that you described earlier provide a linkage between the social economic aspects on rangelands with the ecological processes and the natural resource processes in rangelands. So together, the goods and services combine these two aspects. And when we think about rangeland management, we know that we have to consider all three of these different components to meet the needs of society. When we consider the social, economic, and ecological information that we have, we can use this to make informed decisions, but in order to do that, we have to understand what some of the trade-offs are between these different um, information sources, especially concerning different goods and services for particular areas. So that's one of the things we're going to look at today. What are some of the trade-offs? that you might face as a land manager when you're trying to meet the needs of society while making your rangeland sustainable for future generations. So today in class, we're gonna talk about some of the pros and cons to different social, economic, and ecological components on a rangeland system. And here's just kind of an example of a few of the goods and services that we find on rangelands and what the dividends of those goods and services are. So this information was taken from Sustainable Rangeland Ecosystem Goods and Services, and the PDF you can see below if you're interested in researching this more. But I think it's really interesting to think about all three components so we can determine where the trade-offs need to occur when we're managing landscapes. So you can read through these, but we can briefly go over the fishing and hunting one, for example. So economic, what does that do for the economy? One, we can sell licenses, gears, and guide services. That's going to bring value into the community, right? Financial value into the community. Um, economic also assess rights to fish or to hunt on private and public land. So we often have discussions about private and public land. 
a lot of times the water is found on private, so a lot of times the wildlife is found on private land. So how do we assess those rights and how do we um, have hunt, fishing and hunting available to public? Some of the environmental concerns we have to think about is we want to make sure that we have healthy wildlife populations. We want to make sure that we maintain biodiversity and that we have controlled hunting populations. And the Idaho Fish and Game does a fantastic job about figuring out what the populations need to be and how many hunting licenses can be issued. Social and cultural, um, this can go back to how you feel. So it's, it's fun to go out, right, and fish and hunt, or it's fun to watch wildlife. And so we wanna make sure that we preserve their habitat and the open space so we can do that. So obviously, society's values of rangeland goods and services are going to change over time. And this information is based on some unpublished um, data from Fee Busby out of Utah State University. But I really like it because it shows how our values have changed over time. And if you'll think back to our history lecture, you're already aware that things obviously change as far as goods and services, as well as how we manage different resources. So pre-settlement in the early 1700s, a lot of our food and fiber came from native plants and animals and materials. There was obviously no boundaries on land at this time. In the 17 and 1800s, we had a lot more exploration. With exploration, we had more domesticated wildlife come onto rangelands. We had land that was discovered, and we also had the discovery of different goods and services on rangelands. For example, beaver pelts became a, a, a hot commodity, I guess I'll say. In the 18 and 1900s, this is a time of land acquisition and disposal. Think back to the Homestead Act. Where did people establish their homesteads? near water, right? And so all of a sudden we're starting to see different values on public lands and private lands. So where do you want to place your homestead near water? This increased our agriculture production as far as food and fiber goes and also brought over domesticated livestock. In the 1900s and 1970s, we didn't have the Homestead Act anymore and all of a sudden we're kind of shifting our management focuses to more land pr preservation or reservation. So we had national forests established, national parks, national monuments. We're really starting to preserve what natural resources that we have or to better understand how we can manage them. Today, a lot of our land management practices are based around multiple use and how we're going to meet society's needs and goals. So this includes things like preserving open space, which wasn't probably an issue back in the 17, 1800s, right? We also think about protecting endangered species. They're um, a definitely uh, an important aspect to any kind of rangeland management practices. We want to make sure that we're creating sustainable rangelands for future use. So we're going to talk about several different goods and services, and we're going to start with livestock grazing. So I'm going to show you some data or information about the goods and service, and then I want you to think about the pros and cons of this good and service that you might have to consider when you're doing any kind of land management practice. What are some of the trade-offs that might occur for both social, economic, and ecological components of this good and service? So here's an example of livestock grazing. And this is from the public land statistics for the Bureau of Land Management only. So this isn't forest service or state lands. And basically what this is showing us is that over the last 60 years, we've had a decline in the amount of livestock that are found on public lands and a decline of 37%. And whether that's good or bad, that's a decision that you can make based on your experiences and understanding. So thinking about those, that data that we just showed, think about some of the social, economic, and ecological factors or the pros and cons in each of these different categories from livestock grazing. To help you think about some of the impacts it might have on multiple uses, here are some of the hot topics, or what I'm going to call the hot topics, of rangeland issues. So let's think about livestock grazing. What might be some of the pros of livestock grazing? When we think about wildlife habitat, can livestock be compatible with that? Well, when we looked at the fire section, we understood that livestock grazing has been used to reduce spine fuels through targeted grazing practices. And in doing so, hopefully we minimize the spread of fire, which in turn would increase more wildlife habitat on a site. When we think about rural communities, a lot of them are very dependent on agricultural products, including livestock grazing. 
so it gives an economic boost to a lot of our rural communities. What about some of the social aspects? We might think about open space or preserving the culture or heritage of what people imagine the Western, um, Western United States is. And that's a really important aspect that we have to consider. What might be some of the negatives of some of these um, aspects? Livestock grazing, although not always, has been shown to spread invasive species, either by seeds getting caught in fur or through fecal material. Um, livestock grazing could have negative impacts with recreation. We'll watch a video in a little bit, but there can be negative interactions between recreationists and livestock. And livestock. So just think about some of these things. There's not one answer for all, but rather it's just showing you that there's definitely trade-offs. If you recall back to our definition of rangeland management, you'll know that rangeland management is using the natural resources that we have to meet the needs of society. Well, how do we know what society's needs are? This is an example of some work that J.D. Wolfhurst did. He's with the University of Idaho, a social scientist, and his colleagues, Mill Rimby, Scott Jensen, and Paul Lewin. And they assessed three different demographic populations, urban, rural, and members of Oahe County, to assess different rangeland practices and to see whether they were favorable or unfavorable to these different communities. So this one's pertinent to livestock grazing. And on the x-axis, you can see that they wanted to see to what extent people considered livestock grazing as healthy or unhealthy in working landscapes. And it's no surprise that rural communities and Oahe County found livestock grazing to be very healthy. It's a huge economic driver in these communities. Plus they have a lot of these natural resources that, that are available, they're renewable and they can be used. It's interesting to look at the urban feel of different livestock grazing. So in general, they do view it as very healthy or somewhat healthy, but there's still a lot of um, components that you have to consider when managing for society needs. This is a great video that also shows the utility of livestock grazing relative to wildlife habitat, specifically salmon. That's something we haven't talked a lot about in this class, but it's definitely a huge issue that we should consider. So take a minute to watch this video and to think about the pros and cons of livestock grazing and how it interacts with wildlife management. So wildfire is not necessarily a good or a service on rangeland, but it's definitely a disturbance that affects a lot of our goods and services. So I just wanted to hurry and briefly mention it here. A lot of people like to show the AUM figure that I just showed that shows us having declining AUMs with this, with the wildfire figure that is right here. So here we're looking at acres, which is the gray bars, and then we're also looking at the number of fires, which is represented by the orange line. So over time, from 1960 to 2006, the number of acres that have burned has increased by 22% across the nation. So this isn't specific to Idaho. And we're seeing these large fires, however, the number of fires is also decreasing. So it's decreasing by about 46% since 1960. So you have to think, is this connected with livestock grazing or not? Some people will claim that because we have less livestock grazing, we have a buildup of fuels, which is causing us to have larger wildfires. And that could be definitely an argument that's worth considering. But on the flip side, we might also be having less numbers of fire because we have better suppression techniques. Although we have larger fires due to invasive weeds, it has nothing to do with livestock grazing. So there's different patterns and there's definitely, again, not one answer that fits it all. But it's something to think about and it's something that you have to always be constantly considering when you're doing land management decisions. Take a minute to think about the pros and cons of wildfire. This one is really interesting to me as a restoration ecologist. So when we think about wildfire, there's definitely social, economic, and ecological impacts. As an ecologist, I really am focused on restoring plant communities back so we have good, healthy forage for livestock, we have wildlife habitat, our water cycle's intact, our soils are intact. Those are kind of my drivers when I think about my research. However, I was presenting a, a presentation the other day to some ranchers and ranchers made me realize that always, that not always do my views meet their views. For example, after a fire, we get a certain flush of funds that we can use to go and restore a landscape. And usually those funds, ex or those funds have expired in two to three years in the past and now they're extended so they can last up to five or six years, which is great from the ecological view. It gives me more chance to have you know, a good rain event when I'm seeding than it did before. 
However, by extending that, that means that I'm having a negative impact on a lot of economic values in these rural communities. For example, after a wildfire, livestock are typically held off that land for two years. It's just kind of the standard practice, whether it's good or bad, again, that depends on your views. But if I extend that policy to have funding for five or six years, that means that I don't want livestock to be on the land for five or six years. So again, that's having a negative impact on livestock producers and the economy of rural communities because I'm holding back the livestock from going in these ecological restoration areas. So it's just a trade-off that you have to consider. This is a great video that shows both the social, economic, and ecological aspects to wildfire. So take a minute to think about this and, and to write your pros and cons for wildfire. One of the things we have to consider when we're thinking about goods and services is urbanization. So our population densities are continuing to increase in Idaho. Between 1950 and 2000, our population increased by 700,000. Between 2000 and 2016, which is only 16 years versus 50 years, it increased by almost 400,000. So obviously it's growing quite a bit. And what this does is it places different demands on rangelands. Take a minute to think of the pros and cons of urbanization, especially the social, economic, and ecological impacts. So sometimes in rural communities, we view urbanization as negative, but it doesn't always have to be that way. One of the pros of urbanization is oftentimes it increases economic growth in rural communities because people want to get out and look at open spaces. They want to get out of the city, and with that means that they bring their money to different communities. They like to recreate on rangelands. On the flip side, Think about water. So water has to come from somewhere to support human populations. And oftentimes, water is drawn from our natural resources or our rangeland areas to sustain human populations. So that could be a con for urbanization. Urbanization shifts land ownership. And with the shift in land ownership, we might start fragmenting landscapes, which would have a negative impact on wildlife habitat. If we fragment landscapes, that means that uh, corridors that wildlife might use regularly are impacted, which means they can't move and we could see different population impacts on wildlife because of that. Urbanization makes us think that there needs to be an increase in energy development. As human population grows, there's more demand for these natural resources. So it's just kind of a, it's a trade-off. And again, you have to think about these different components. So I wanted to throw this example in for urbanization, especially just looking at the news and looking at about what's happening in California, which is, which is unfortunate and really scary. But you can see that um, urbanization is moving into wildland areas, and a lot of these wildland areas are forest or rangeland settings. And this is a stat from the NRCS, this quote, and it, it talks about the conversion rate into these wildland urban interface areas which is, the acronym is WUI, and that's something you'll hear in this profession quite a bit. But you can see that this conversion rate from wildland to urban areas is going at three acres per minute, 4,000 acres per day, and close to two million acres a year. So there's a lot of areas that are experiencing this conversion. The percentage of wildland interfaces that have been developed um, since 2013 in Idaho is 10%. So that's that area, that border between the two, 10% has been developed. In Colorado, it's close to 21% and Wyoming, 4%. So I wanted to show those other states so you can kind of get a relative view of, of where we stand in Idaho. But there's pros and cons with urbanization, right? And I think a lot of people have different views whether this Louis area is, a, is favorable or not. It's kind of exciting to think that people might be more invested in natural resources and care about their natural resources. But on the flip side, it's really expensive to maintain gluey areas. Um, a lot of times, fire suppression in these areas is extreme and unfortunately um, could be very dangerous to, to humans as well as to structures. And, and so there's pros and cons. Recreation is obviously an important part when we think about rangeland management. And this is a study that was conducted by the Social Science Research Unit at the University of Idaho. And in this survey, Idaho residents were asked whether they approve or disapprove of different uses on our public lands, specifically recreational uses. And to me, what this is showing is that the public is interested in a balanced management approach. There's not really one activity that outweighed another one. There are some fluctuations. Obviously, energy development and transition is kind of one of the lower ones. 
that people were felt comfortable with, but but there's definitely still favorable or positive um, feelings about those kind of public land uses. Here's an example from J.D. Wolfert's work that we talked about. This one is looking at whether the public approves or um, does not approve different recreational activities again. And in this one, they have those three de demographics. And you can see that in general, I mean, people are pretty favorable for using our rangelands for most recreational activities. The ORVs or the off-road vehicles are one of the lower ones as well as energy development, which is just like the one we just looked at. Um, hunting is, is pretty favorable. Equestrian, trail riding is really favorable. So in general, I mean, I would think society wants us to manage for multiple uses. Recreation is definitely not going away. So here's just a few examples from the um, long-term national trends in outdoor recreation activities. So again, this is a nationwide survey that was done from 1980 to now. But you can see that recreation is not decreasing in any of these aspects or any of the ones they surveyed. Camping's increased by 89% from what it was in the early 1980s. Fishing, hunting's increasing, off-road vehicles. Bird watching or viewing or photographing birds has increased by 287%. Day hiking, backpacking, all of that's increased. So it's not like it's gonna stop or that we have to stop managing for recreation. If anything, it, this upward trend is, is something that we have to take advantage of and we have to manage for. And there could be social, economic, and ecological factors to this. So list some of the pros and cons to recreation. There's a lot, and I can't cover them all, but some of the ones I was thinking of is that recreation can benefit rural communities. It can bring people into different communities where they can spend money as they recreate. Um, it could also bring employment or job opportunities to some of these rural communities. On the negative side, it might cost money to maintain certain trails or facilities used for recreation, so it's kind of a trade-off with that. Wildlife habitat, there can be positive or negative interactions with that. Uh, recreation to view wildlife is definitely favorable, although sometimes recreationists can have negative impacts on wildlife, especially young wildlife. Um, even things like getting hit or hitting a deer or, you know, something with your car can have a negative impact on wildlife. Things like, um, sorry, I'm reading some of these. Things like weed invasion is an interesting one to think about. So a lot of times with recreationists, we're unaware of weed seeds that get stuck in our socks, for example, and we can have a spread of invasive species. Recreation can increase our probability of having wildfires in area. Smokey the Bear does a pretty good job at helping us contain our fires, although sometimes they still get away. We can have erosion or compaction issues, which might affect um, our soil health and what can be restored after certain areas. So there's a lot of different pros and cons. So here's an example of recreational impacts on wildlife, specifically hikers on mule deer. So if you look at this figure, um, on the left-hand side, or the y-axis, this is going to be the probability of flushing. And if you're at a 1.0, that means it's 100% probability, and then it decreases as you go down on that graph. The x-axis is meters from the disturbance or that interaction. So if you're a pedestrian hiking on a trail alone, you're going to have little or minimal impact on flushing a mule deer. If you're a pedestrian alone and you're off trail, it changes the dynamics. So if you're within, what, 20 meters of a mule deer, then the probability that you're going to flush that animal or cause some kind of um, response is 80%. So it kind of, it changes the dynamics. It even changes it more if you're a pedestrian with a dog. So if you're on trail with a dog, you can be 50 meters within um, that animal and you have a 60% probability that you're gonna flush it or have some kind of impact on the mule deer. If you're a pedestrian with a dog that's walking off trail, that increases a, a, a lot. So you can be 100 meters away from the animal, but with that dog and being off trail, it's greater than 60% probability that you're going to flush the mule deer. So again, you have to think about all these different components when you're trying to manage for multiple uses. This is a great video that emphasizes the um, interaction between recreation and livestock. 
So I would encourage you to uh, watch it. Rain clouds dominate much of the western half of the United States and represent a significant source of alternative energy resources. Energy is essential to sustainable development. Nevertheless, it's quite controversial, especially on rangelands. As of 2014, Idaho did not produce energy from any kind of fossil fuels like coal or natural grass or crude oil. However, energy development from renewable energy sources like biofuels, solar, wind, water, geothermal, all of that has continually increased since the 1960s. In fact, here on this graph, you can see it's increased by 51%. And um, you can also see here that we in Idaho consume quite a bit more energy than we actually produce. So in 2014, 520 trillion BTU was produced here, and we used 155 trillion BTU. So that's more than three folds our consumption versus our production. So if you want more information about energy development in Idaho, I just mentioned a few things, but this is out of the Idaho State Profile and Energy Estimates from U.S. Energy Information Administration. It's really interesting to me to see how or what energy is being developed in Idaho and what is not. Um, I think it's important when we think about rangeland and rangeland management, for example, wind energy, you can drive around the state and see a lot of different um, windmills that are out and going, and, and it's been interesting to kind of think about wildlife populations relative to wind energy production. And there's quite a few studies that are out. Hydroelectric power, it's, it's not surprising to me that a lot of the energy that Idaho produces is from that. Uh, think about the large rivers in Idaho and harnessing that energy to create electricity makes sense to me. Um, geothermal resources, if you just think about the geological position of Idaho, that seems like something that we could capture better. And I like these because they're renewable energy sources. And even though they're renewable, we still have to consider the pros and cons because there's definitely both in all these different aspects. So take a minute to think about the pros and cons of energy development. Think about some of the things that you like about energy and some of the things that maybe we could do more efficiently so we could have less of a negative impact on our natural resources. So here is um, J.D. Wolfer's study again, looking at energy development and looking at those three different demographic populations. And you can see there's really not a huge difference between ur urban, rural, and Oahe County residents when it comes to energy development. And it fits in line with the previous surveys we've looked at. Over 50% approve of energy development. Um, however, it's not really greater than 50% in a lot of cases. So it's something to consider. People like energy. We like using energy. However, we need to be strategic when we place our energy developments, and we have to be creative when we use these natural resources. And I think that's one of the most exciting parts about rangeland is, is really being creative with the resources that we have to meet this society's needs and to doing it strategically. Hopefully you've got some idea of some of the goods and services and the social, economic, and ecological impacts that they have on rangelands. It's obviously not an easy subject, but it's also an exciting one. It's interesting to think about what our society needs are right now, but also think about how we're going to make sustainable rangelands for future generations. We want to make sure that we can pass on traditional uses of rangeland to people. We want to make sure that it's economically viable and ecologically sustainable.